You guys will also <laughs> call the meeting to order. Roll call, please. Here. 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 Meeting has been properly noticed. Um, we will consider adjourning to closed session under sections 19.5, parent one, parent C, considering employment, promotion, compensation, or performance evaluation data of any public employee over which the governmental body has jurisdiction or exercises responsibility. Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. So this is, uh, the next item is public comment, and if you're on Zoom meeting and want to speak, um, now is the time to open your mic or send a chat and we'll try to get you heard. And if anybody's in the audience wants to speak, um, come to one of the microphones. <clears throat> yes, go ahead. Um, my name is Barb Buss from Laval. Um, I was here back in March or April, I'm not really sure when it was, but anyway. Um, when I was here the last time I was talking about um, Laval school closing um, and I went back to work the next day and I was talking with one of my coworkers, uh, Scott Conderman, and he is going to turn 65 at the end of this year and he said that when his son was in Laval school they were talking about closing Laval school. And I thought, well, that was some time ago. So I guess, I think that over the years there's been kind of a surge in let's close the outlying schools and then it kind of goes back down and then there's another surge in let's close the outlying schools and then it kind of calms back down. But people have been getting that message for uh, 20 to 30 years at least. Um, and so I know when my son was in kindergarten, there was kind of an uptick in Laval school is closing, and from the time he was in kindergarten to first grade, three kids transferred out. I think it was said that it was because of Laval school was closing. They wanted to go to a different school. One went to a parochial school, I believe. And uh, so anyway, I guess after that meeting too, uh, my cousin said, well, you know, the, the answer from the school board is the numbers need to come up in Laval to keep it closed, but after a lot of years of talk of Laval school closing and possibly Loganville, I'm not really sure. I'm guessing it's the same thing. You know, after it's in people's minds for that many years, it's kind of going to be hard to get everybody to get back on board with the outlying schools and sending their kids there unless there's some sort of a, you know, statement, definite statement that, yeah, send your kids there. These schools won't be closed. So I just wanted to say that. And then, in addition to that, I was talking to a friend of mine who has uh, two little grandkids, I believe. The oldest was in kindergarten in Laval School last year, and he also has a little brother. And she said that they've been going back and forth and back and forth um, with the uncertainty, with the COVID. You know, how many days a week are the kids going to be there? Is it going to close? Is it going to go virtual? And finally, they made the decision today just sign them up for St. Peter's. They're, they're, you know, and I understand that the, everybody's in an uproar. There's no certainties. There's, nobody knows what to expect, but I would just like to say, um, as soon as there's some clarity, uh, if you can make a policy and stick to it, I think it'd be reduce a lot of anxiety for a lot of people. And maybe Gabe can comment on, you know, maybe some other kids choosing an alternative because of the anxiety due to school closings or outline school closings, the uncertainty, sending their kids elsewhere in the, you know, not staying in the district or maybe some other anxieties about the COVID and people not wanting to have to uh, 
homeschool their little, little, little ones especially. So that's all I had. Thank you. Thank you, Barb. Anyone else? Denise, you have Ellen? Denise? No one? Okay. <coughs> Seeing no one else, we move on to the next item, which is the presentation of the 2019-2020 CLC report. All that's going to amount to tonight is that we're presenting it to you. It's yours. It's in the packet. An opportunity for you to review it. And um, uh, at, if you've got questions about it or if there are um, elements of it that you want uh, clarity or more information, whatever it might be, we can um, bring that to you at a future meeting. We just wanted to kind of meet the requirement of prov providing you with the report itself. So. Okay. Any board members have any questions? Hearing none, move on to the next item, which is correspondence. We did have one correspondence or a couple things in the packet. One is a thank you card received from the family of Lester Weiss. That is Lucinda Herb's husband, uh, or I'm sorry, father, father excuse me, um, thanking the district for the floral arrangement. And then upcoming is the 2020 um, regional fall, CESA fall meeting, and this is an online meeting only. It'd be October 13th from 7 to 8 p.m. So I think you all probably have gotten that information, mm -hmm. except maybe John. Um, but that's all. Anybody have anything else on uh, correspondence? Hearing none. Um, Go to committee reports, um, administration committee reports. Um, do we have any committees meet? No. Nope. I don't believe so. Mm -hmm. um, administrative reports, Mr. Yeager. I'll try to keep this brief, uh, even though the uh, world of athletics right now is changing daily, mm -hmm. weekly. Uh, and trying to keep most of the board members up to date on a weekly basis um, on some of the developments that happen each week with reference to athletics. Um, as most of you know, uh, the approach to at least what we're going to focus on tonight is fall athletics is, is very regional. Um, it's based on where school districts are at, what counties they're in, what their county health departments have supported. Um, the local districts with information and recommendations and we have all we have used all of those um, to create what you see on the screen uh, in front of you as an example of what we like to call our 2020 COVID standards rubrics uh, these are a collaborative effort between uh, Salt County Health Department uh, Reedsburg Area Medical Center personnel uh, our head coaches uh, and myself in creating uh, standardized uh, guidelines. Uh, some of those you can see. Uh, the ones in blue that have changed as of last week per recommendations of the Sauk County Health Department uh, on ways that we can operate our athletic programs safely and uh, following COVID guidelines. Uh, the good news is that today, August 17th, uh, we started practice of our low exposure sports of girls golf, girls tennis, and cross country. Uh, this is just an example of uh, the rubric for, I believe it's cross country, and it contains general information that pertains to every sport, but it also has information on what is very sports to come in and just say, Sound like a trailer from an upcoming movie. <laughs> so without going into great detail, uh, because each of our fall sports that we are looking at uh, pursuing has these rubrics, um, 
move into the second part of the presentation tonight, which uh, was developed uh, over the last few weeks and was delivered to us uh, via the WIA in the Board of Control meeting, uh, which occurred last Friday, which the Board of Control has provided, uh, along with their uh, medical staff in the WIA, with uh, WIA return to full sports considerations, uh, which we have and will continue to fold into their recommendations and their guidelines into our COVID standards. Um, the sports-specific considerations, they did exactly the way that we did it. Hello? Hello? Yeah? <laughs> oh. Uh, these sports-specific uh, considerations for return to fall sports are very comprehensive. They uh, talk about individual competitor requirements, face coverings. They want to hear me at home. So. Um, <clears throat> set up and breakdowns of equipment, care for equipment, personal hygiene, um, social distancing, coaches' meetings, considerations for structures of events, spectators, et cetera, et cetera. So this, these guidelines provided now by the WIA will help us in not only making decisions on how to uh, pursue our, the operations of our athletic programs, but will also give us uh, very sports-specific considerations related to uh, having fans, how to conduct events, and all of those things very safely. So we have a ton of resources at our disposal. And uh, like I said before, it's a collaborative effort between now the WIA and all, all of our local resources to um, come up with a management plan of these programs. Uh, they even go as far as the WIA created a uh, medical clearance form uh, for sports participation after a positive test or symptom of COVID. So this is a standard form that you will use, or we will use, uh, should we, if, when, uh, those types of symptoms do occur with our participants and, part and positive tests do occur or if they are quarantined. The WI Board of Control also released um, an etched in stone. Uh, Barb, if you want to put up the other document. We now have uh, in front of you four seasons for the 2021 uh, sport offerings. You see at the top we have the traditional sport offerings with uh, shorter in that order. practice times begin later in the year. Uh, as many of you might know, as of today, we would have had all of our fall sports in full motion if this was a normal, normal year. Uh, we are uh, starting our low contact sports today uh, with all the COVID regulations in place. And September 7th, as you'll see on the top there, uh, we will look to pursue the medium and high contact sports, uh, if at all possible. Uh, the winter sports seasons, uh, for those of you that are in the know, have been uh, shortened. The start dates of those uh, have been uh, moved forward in the calendar or later in the, in the year. And the end dates of those sports have also been shortened up on the backside. The main reason for that, Barb, if you go a little farther down, uh, is for the part in yellow, which is the alternative fall season. Just to give you a little bit of information on this, uh, there's two ways you can take part of an, in an alternative fall season, and this will occur, as you can see in the dates, uh, beginning in March and uh, ending as late as May 17th. First of all, a district, for example, that goes virtual, uh, does not have school or chooses not to pursue any fall 
sports. That includes the low contact, medium contact, and high contact uh, sports. And for those of you that don't know, our low contact sports I've already mentioned. The medium contact sport is boys soccer. The high contact sports are volleyball and football. Um, if your school district chooses not to uh, pursue any or all, uh, you can cherry pick the sports. You can move them, if you choose to, to the alternative fall season, which will be hosted in early spring. Also, if a school district like Reedsburg begins to pers pursue a season, and let's say they're not able to finish it, if you pursue a fall season and a fall schedule and you do not uh, get through 50% of your sports season, you can play the remaining part of your season in the spring during these time frames. So they are providing a, an actual provision which uh, has shortened winter sports seasons and spring sports seasons so they can shoehorn an alternative fall sports season in the middle of them. So as we continue to move forward with our planning, um, we have had to take a year's worth of work and basically set it aside to find new competitions, new schedules within the new time frames and hire new officials. And now we'll have to based on this model for the entire school year. Um, the, I'm presently working on not only those sports schedules, but uh, plans for hosting events, the potential for streaming live events, protocols for spectators, which leads me to this. Uh, many of you know the Menards rule. Um, we are going to implement the Menards rule. If you are able to come on district property to view a sporting event, you will see one of these signs on the fences and you will be required to wear a mask, whether it's inside or outside, to all of our events. Now, participation in these and spectators in our events is a privilege, it's not a right. So based on the state mandate for face coverings, as we're all demonstrating this evening, and for the safety of our participants, the future of those sports that we are trying to pursue for the, not only the benefit of our participants, their families, but for our community, we are going to implement mandatory face coverings at all of our events. And our event staff will be enforcing that. So, all that being said, uh, we're trying to be very transparent with our planning, <clears throat> trying to keep everybody informed, but as you full well know, that there's always people that fall through the cracks. We will continue our diligence, not only using social media, but uh, sport websites, my website, district resources, <clears throat> district personnel, to spread the message that it is our hope to continue to play for kids. But, as all of you know, this all could change tomorrow. But that isn't stopping our diligence and our efforts to try to continue these things, like I said before, for our kids, for our families, and for our community. So I know this is a lot of information. Believe me, this is just an, a brief overview of all the information I could provide for you. I will continue to give you weekly updates as a school board on directions that we are going, things that are happening. But as of today, we started some really good stuff for kids. So based on anything that I just presented, you have any initial questions or anything that I didn't cover that you would like to ask me about the directions that we're going? Any board members have questions? Neil? Yes, Brian, I have one. How, uh, 
I, I mean, we have the girls cross country or cross country, you know, protocol here, mm -hmm. and it talks about uh, social distancing six feet. How is that going to be accomplished with mm -hmm. our sports like volleyball, soccer, and football in particular? Um, there'll be mask requirements when athletes uh, are in competition. It's probably the only time, just because of health reasons, that they're not able to wear masks. Um, as an activities department, we will be issuing um, face coverings to all of our athletes, uh, basically as a uniform protocol. And uh, just to give you an example, because you mentioned uh, volleyball specifically, when they are competing on the floor, they won't be wearing a mask. But when they're subbed out, because if they're going to sit on a bench, you're absolutely right, Neil, they're not going to be able to social distance. They're not going to be able to sit six feet apart. That's when the face coverings come on. Um, well, I, I still go back to how do you social distance and play a football game? The, the obviously tackling you can't. Um, we we are troubleshooting those things with our sanitation methods, uh, using the products that we have at our disposal, um, and you know. Just taking information from other, other school districts, other venues, uh, there's a lot of considerations and, and, and I have been asked very good questions uh, about even within our own organization of, you know, how can college sports, how can the Big Ten cancel a football season and so on and so forth, um, you know, we still consider to do those things. There's a, lot, there's a lot of things in our arena that we can control and believe me that the most flexible individuals that are in high school sports are the kids. If we put expectations on them that they are to wear face coverings, except for during competition, they will do that. Um, we don't have to have we don't have to have fans to put on those things. We don't need. I mean, we enjoy the revenue we get from ticket sales, but we could legitimately. Um, not have fans at our sporting events and still allow kids to play. That's not always the case at college. That's not always the case at professional levels. But we use their information of what they're presently doing or what they propose to do with reference to locker room management and contest management and sideline management to create our rubrics for those sports. But it goes without saying, football and volleyball would not be considered a high-contact sport if, it wasn't, if there wasn't more of a risk in those sports because we can't protect those athletes 24-7 while they're participating. <clears throat> so I don't know if I answered your question directly. I don't know if I have an answer. tell us how we can do those things. They wouldn't have put forth uh, football protocols and volleyball protocols for contests and locker room management and equipment management and all of those things if it was in their mind impossible to do. It's impossible to eliminate the risk, <clears throat> totally. But we're going to do everything in our power to, to find every resource so that we can provide potentially an opportunity in those very high-risk contact sports. I guess what you're telling me, though, is at the end of the day, those sports will have a much higher risk than golf and, and uh, our other low-impact sports. Correct. Question that I do have, you talk about rubrics. What is a rubric if uh, uh, one athlete gets uh, COVID or two or it starts to go through a team? When do we, what, what is our rubric in terms of how we deal with that? Uh, if you read the, each one of those uh, rubrics in detail, it will give you uh, both standardized protocols for what we call level one, level two, and level three exposures. Level one exposure means that an athlete is put, tested positive. You'll see that right there in symptom or test positive. Participant is positive. Level two means that a family member is positive and they're quarantined. Level three means that they were camping with Aunt Linda this past weekend and now Aunt Linda's tested positive. They've been in contact 
with someone who has now tested positive. Over on the right hand side, you'll see sports specific implementation of those types of level one, level two, and level three contacts. And what protocols that we will do, what notifications we will have, and we have also set forward in our practice plans about practicing in pods, pods of athletes, so that should we have a level one exposure, that portions of our teams potentially could be affected rather than having the entire team affected. But that's, that's all situational. You're absolutely right, Neil. In a, in a football game, <laughs> they're around everybody sure. during so, the game. So the, so the question really is, Brian, I, I see the level one. So what if you have two level one exposures? Do you shut down a program with two exposures? Do you shut it down with 10 exposures? When do you, when do you shut down a program? I think that would be based on the control levels that we implement and in the individual situations. Uh, it's, we, we try to standardize the responses to these things and I just, I don't have a number for you. Okay. It'll depend on, the, it depend on the team, it'll depend on the pods that they've been practicing in and you're right, there is uh, an extreme potential in any of our sports because there's, there's not one of them that has no risk that if athletes have a level one exposure and they contract COVID that we have the potential of just shutting down that entire sport. So, so what we, about... We could start seasons and, and they just don't end. Sure. So, so what about uh, social distancing for... Um, uh, 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 viewers uh, that come to like a football game. I know you, you, you've got masks down. Are we going to be social distancing right. like we are in the auditorium here or, or are we just going to neglect that part of uh, good COVID practice? That's a great question and that's the main reason why we're doing this right here. I understand that's yeah. why we're doing that, but why are we not doing a six foot social distancing for um, people who come to view? We can require that, but in the real world, us being able to police it at a football game, it, I mean, we can try, but we're not going to be able to, to catch everybody. So, I mean, it's, it's, we can do one of two things. Either, either we can require masks and say, we also request that you social distance. And when you don't, at least you have a mask on, okay? Or we can just say no fans, Neil. That's it. That's a straightforward answer I can give you. We could say wear a mask and social distance. We will. But enforcing the social distancing is a greater of a challenge for us greater of a challenge for, for any program or any school that has spectatorship than requiring a mask. The percentages of us being able to police the gate when they walk in and say, we need to have you have a face covering. If you don't have one, we have some here. Or you can't come in. And we also request that you social distance. It's just... It's just the realities of it, Neil, is that it's going to be hard for us to keep people social distancing if they're spectators. We don't know who's family members. Family members can sit next to each other at a game. You know, looking at somebody from the outside, we, uh, unless we go up and talk to them, we, don't, we won't have that ability. So, yes, we'll have limitations on how many people we can let in. Uh, just like we have limitations on how many kids we can safely transport on buses in school vehicles. All those, all those things apply, but I, I guess I don't have an answer for you other than yes, we are going to do our best to try to keep people socially distanced. But the realities of us being able to control that 100% of the time, it's just not going to happen. It's just reality. That's why the masks are there. 
I wish I could tell you that we could keep people socially distanced 100% of the time, but realities of it are is that we're not going to be able to. We're going to try. So, great questions. They're they're awesome questions, and they're they're questions that everybody's either thinking about and doesn't they don't have the courage to, to ask them. But the realities of it are is that we are going to do our diligence to try to control everything that we can control uh, with reference to spectatorship. And if we find we can't control it sufficiently, then we just have to eliminate, spec eliminate spectatorship. Anybody else? I just wanted to say the six foot rule, the social distancing, I understand it completely but it's a, it's a struggle everywhere. It, it's, it's not just our sporting events and school, and I know we're trying to do the best to control things here, but the social distancing is a struggle everywhere, so. Yep. I just want to say that I, I appreciate that you've put in a lot of time and effort, as have all the other uh, coaches, ADs, and WIA, so I think uh, the, the kids, the families appreciate that, and we hope the season goes. Um, We'll see, uh, and I also appreciate you keeping us in the loop, uh, kind of on day-to-day, -day, week by week basis, because we get a lot of questions. So I appreciate the information. Yeah, and please don't hesitate to, if you have a question come up, or especially if you have a, a somebody from the public who asks you a question and you don't have an answer for, just email me directly, and I'll, I'll try to get you. If I don't have an answer, I will try to get you one ASAP in the best that we can about how we're going to try to do things. But the good news, again, is that we're going to try to do things. Thank you, Brian. You bet. Thank you. Mr. Olson. <clears throat> good evening. Not me. <laughs> <laughs> Mask on, I know it's hard to tell. <laughs> sure you know. <laughs> August uh, teacher in service is the uh, um, topic here. Uh, and I provided you with an outline. Uh, as you know, last uh, May, going into June, uh, our staff spent quite a bit of time familiarizing themselves with online uh, tools and remote teaching strategies. Uh, and I felt like we got our feet under us uh, pretty well with tools. Um, as you might imagine, as, as the summer has, has uh, come along here, there's been a lot of great resources that have come out. Uh, we had uh, some administrators and staff participate last Monday, the 10th, in a remote teaching institute put on by Solution Tree. That's the same folks that put on the uh, PLC events uh, that we've attended quite a bit. Uh, and they'll continue to be great resources that come out. Um, I say that because uh, with our teacher in service this year, uh, which starts tomorrow already, uh, one of the keys is going to be flexibility. <coughs> and uh, our, our district's role, uh, and my role to a certain extent, is pushing out uh, the latest and greatest resources for our staff. Uh, to get them on their feet and, and so they can be successful here once kids arrive. Uh, a big part of that this year, to a certain extent, is going to be getting out of the teacher's way. Uh, we don't have many hard scheduled events. Uh, we are not going to be gathering staff in groups larger than uh, uh, one building, a uh, cohort of one building, uh, for obvious reasons, right? Uh, that's a safety precaution. Um, with that in mind, we do have some goals uh, for the in-service. Uh, number one, that's to uh, pre prepare our environments to be as safe as possible for staff and students. And that is going to be a big challenge and time commitment at the building level and individual teacher level. We did have a new teacher in-service last week. Uh, we have seven new staff this year, by the way. Smallest number since I've been here, uh, which is good. Um, but even with that, 
uh, even with those four days, uh, we did make some pretty significant changes uh, to what we were able to do with those folks uh, and with their mentors um, because of COVID. And as you might imagine, at the building and teacher level, they're going to be doing a lot of those same things here in the next week. So uh, time will be precious. Um, so with the in-service, uh, we're going to be pushing out some modules um, uh, with some resources. Our other goal is to prepare classrooms to be able to pivot between in-person and online learning. Um, I think most everyone in education anticipates uh, some pivots uh, possibly throughout the year. Um, so it's really, really important that our teachers prepare starting day one with the idea that maybe on day two or three, uh, students, uh, possibly all of them, might need to pivot to just online. So there are some strategies for that, and there are some good tools to use to make sure our staff is ready for that. Uh, another um, goal or focus uh, of some time is to identify and prepare for learning gaps. So on the schedule, that is called the flashback, flash forward meetings. And real simply, that's just a grade level thinking back to last spring and what did uh, the, the kids not grasp uh, because of that time that was missed. And then taking that information and flashing forward and meeting with uh, the successive grade level and having those conversations. Here's where the kids might be. Uh, here's what you might want to do to start the year because our kids unfortunately weren't able to grasp certain concepts. So we'll be having those meetings. Uh, and lastly, with the, uh, the amount of work uh, that needs to be put in, uh, in terms of a lot of new things, procedures, precautions, uh, lesson planning that'll be much different. We want our staff to lean on their PLC teams and uh, really do a great job of collaborating and working together to solve those everyday problems. So that's the report in a nutshell. Any questions? May I have any questions for Mark? Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Thank, Thank you, Mark. Mark. Looks like the next one is a tag team between Ms. Brune and Mr. Fry. Donations from Edward Jones and Reesburg Utility. <clears throat> I'd love to be this tall, but I'm not. All right, we um, this year are not able to have students access our water fountains or bubblers, but we do have access to bottle fillers. And so we want to make sure that every student in the elementary level has a water bottle. So Mr. Fry contacted RUC, Reesburg Utility Commission, and who do we have to thank for a donation there? Uh, so it was a team of um, John and Brett and Tara over there. They, uh, when I called them, I just explained we're gonna have a water access issue, um, especially at our K through five level. We know that with our water fountains off, we're gonna have kids show up day one who can't have a drink of water, and so, uh, they were great. They jumped right on board and um, were willing to donate $1,000 um, on top of Edward Jones's $1,000 as well. Um, we were able to purchase 1,200 20-ounce uh, water bottles. 600 of them will be um, have the Edward Jones logo. Uh, 600 will have the um, RUC logo on them, as well as the Reedsburg School District logo on all of them. So I think it's just a great thing. One less thing for parents to worry about when they send their students back to school is that they're not gonna have to worry about water on day one. So at Edward Jones, we wanna make sure to thank all of the Edward Jones reps in Reesburg. So that's Charlie Brummer, Matt Cavernan, Kate Schmidt, and Laura Schmidt. So um, a big thank you from the school district to both Edward Jones reps and the Reesburg Utility Commission uh, for each donating $1,000 so we could make this possible for our elementary students. <coughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Another um, example of the kind-hearted people in Reedsburg. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Reddy. Good evening. 
Um, if I interpreted Denise's number signing to me, approximately 85 people were signed in for the Zoom meeting. Uh, if you're not able to see the display, that's the presenter view and you have to pin that. And I don't mean with a physical pin because that's probably what I'd be thinking, what am I pinning? But if you're on this far into the meeting, you know where to go and pin that for the display. Uh, just briefly, some updates for the board. For your information, the Finance Committee, we plan to meet in early October. Our auditors, uh, Hawkins, Ash, CPAs, start our audit uh, tomorrow. It'll be a joy to work with them this week. Uh, Cindy Wilson, our accounting specialist, has prepared all the audit paperwork for them, uploaded our DPI reports. She predicts a surplus for last year's fiscal year of $359,255.59. And as always at this point in time, uh, as we talk about numbers for the last year, it's all subject to change. Uh, I believe we're really close. The auditors are gonna tell us just how close we really are. Um, Carol Wirth with Wisconsin Public Finance Professionals, our financial advisor, using just the municipality's values, uh, is projecting that the school district property values for our next tax year for 2021 may increase by 4.56%. And again, that's just an estimate. We continue to work with Skyward on our cumulative training. We've set 16 training dates. Michelle Thompson, our HR specialist, has been working with them. That'll accumulate about 44 hours of training for our office staff to make the transition to the new software platform that Skyward is offering. Um, the WERC forecast from John Stellmacher, he's at a range of 0.9% to 1.45% for the 21-22 CPI increase, and that's just using the data that comes from um, the, uh, the federal government that tracks our consumer price index. As a reminder, the summer feeding, feeding program continues through August 26th, which will provide meals for the 27th and 28th, that Thursday and Friday also. Last week, we served just over 600 students, breakfast and lunch. If you are 18 and under, we encourage you to participate with that. Just to give you a little update on the safety side, Darren Fry, our Transportation Director and Safety Coordinator, provided to our administrative team an update from the Wisconsin Department of Justice on the Speak Up, Speak Out program. And according to Darren, who's on vacation this week, He's probably one of the 80 that's zoomed into this, or 85, excuse me, um, and maybe not knowing Darren, but the, we're in good shape for drivers as of the last time I talked to him, and that, as Brian said, it could change daily. Are there any questions on the information I provided you this evening? Do we have any questions for Pat? Thank you, Pat. Thank you. Mr. Benson. I have nothing other than um, what's otherwise on the agenda in uh, just a little bit here, other than if you should have any questions about the consent agenda, now would be a terrific time to ask, and I or someone else in the room can answer, I'm sure. Any questions for Tom? Hearing none, we would go into action items, and the first item is the consent agenda. I would entertain a motion to approve. I move to approve the uh, agenda, the consent agenda. Motion by Bruce. Is there a second? I'll second. Second by Alice. Uh, does need to be roll call. No. All those in favor signify by aye. 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 Those opposed? Any abstaining? Motion carried. Second item is, if I can get to it. Um, Item B is consideration changes to the 2020-2021 K-8 and 912 student calendars. We did include a document that shared a couple of the, uh, <clears throat> at least the highlights of the student calendar changes that we're uh, proposing. Um, as you're well aware, with the uncertainty of so many other things in our life these days, there may be others that come along at some point. Most notable, um, you'll see the October 21, 22, and 23, the original calendars for uh, four-year-olds through the eighth grade. Uh, we were not 
scheduled to have students attend on those days because we were going to focus on some uh, professional development opportunities, most notably a PLC Institute uh, that was going to be held in Madison. Uh, we've, well, either we or they have scrapped that idea. Uh, so we're proposing to have students, um, all students would then attend on those dates. Um, November 5th uh, would be changed to be a teacher only day. That's uh, a, the time of the year where we're focused on parent teacher conferencing. And so um, that was supposed to be a shortened school day and um, followed by some parent teacher conferences. <clears throat> we're proposing that that um, not include any student day, but instead allow our teachers to focus the entire day on um, a variety of avenues for communicating with moms and dads about the progress being made by children. Uh, we're not yet proposing a change for the parent-teacher conferences that are scheduled for March 9th and 11th, but um, it's likely that we'll be proposing some uh, similar change there as we are in November, but again, that's not, um, we're not requesting that at this time. And then uh, early release on Fridays, which were originally scheduled at the high school, would be eliminated under our uh, current plan. So we're asking you first for any questions, comments, concerns that you might have about that, but then your action would allow us to uh, create a new calendar reflecting those changes, and then we would uh, do our best to communicate uh, those new calendars to the world so that everybody is as much on the same page as possible. Anybody have any questions on the change to the calendar? Hearing none, would entertain a motion. I would move to approve the uh, calendar changes as presented. Motion by Neil to approve the K-8 and 912 student calendar. Is there a second? I'll second. Second by Gabe. Uh, any other discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor signify by aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstaining? Motion carried. Action item C is changes to the 2020-2021 teacher calendar. Some of the same features obviously need to be reflected in uh, changes to the teacher calendar. Uh, there are also a couple of others. So the earlier approved calendar, um, as I indicated, um, uh, no, I'm sorry, this is a separate issue, included three days of professional development, and those days were sort of unidentified as to the specific dates upon which the professional de development would take place, allowing us to kind of individualize that as best we could. Um, given the current state of affairs, we felt it was important to get our teachers in here a little bit early uh, in preparation for September 1st, and so um, we've already, you've already taken action on this, but we wanted to reflect it to again, um, help communicate to the world that uh, we are having our teachers come on August 18, 19, and 20. I hope they're aware of it because that's just a few hours from now. <laughs> item two on the list, uh, again, item one you've already um, approved and we appreciate that. Item two um, <clears throat> was the October 21, two, and three dates that you just approved um, for the changes to the student calendar. And if you don't change it here, we'll have a problem on those dates. Uh, November 3rd, uh, we would ask that uh, that be changed. Um, this would be um, um, a student day as it's already scheduled, but would eliminate the face-to-face -face portion of parent-teacher conferences that were originally scheduled that day. And again, on November 5th, the next item here, uh, we would not have students and instead spend that entire day um, again, pursuing a variety of um, ways to communicate with moms and dads about the progress being made by students. Item number five on the list, um, again, is just a kind of a forewarning of um, a similar request that might come for the March 9th and 11th parent-teacher conferences, and then um, the obvious but wanted to include that if the changes uh, include a change in the contract, uh, contracted days for our teachers, we'll address that at the end of the year. There likely will be other changes in the meantime. Any questions on the teacher calendar? Changes to it. 
Hearing none, entertain a motion. I make a motion to approve the proposed changes to the 2020-2021 teacher calendar. Motion by Luann to approve. Is there a second? I'll second. Second by Bruce. Anyone have any discussion or comments? Questions? Hearing none, all those in favor signify by aye. 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 Those opposed? Any abstaining? Motion carried. Action item D is considered consideration for facility use beyond August 31st. And I think that's the last date that we use for not allowing outside groups. Right. Before we get into uh, this item, I think I, I'd, if you'll allow me, I'd like to take just a moment of pause uh, to say how grateful we are that we get to have seven people voting on uh, each of these items as we now have a seventh board member. So welcome, John. Thank you. Appreciate you being here. Okay, uh, the facility use beyond August 31st, just as Gary indicated, we had kind of put a, a block on uh, outside users through October 31. Um, the conditions that caused us to make that decision um, either haven't changed or have, in most folks' estimation, uh, gotten worse. And so um, we're going to have a difficult enough time, frankly, uh, making sure that we stay on top of um, providing a safe and sanitary environment for our students and staff each and every day. And so um, I'm recommending that uh, we not allow um, outside users of our facilities until uh, at least January of 2021. Obviously, if things change uh, for the better between now and then, and we want to back off on that, uh, we can do that at a future time. And uh, it's probably just as likely that we'll be talking about it at some point in the future uh, with some consideration of extending the restriction. So for now, we're asking that you approve no outside users of our facility until 2021. Any questions? I have just one, Tom. Is that January 1st, 2021? Yeah, yes, thank you. For, uh, could, could have probably made it clearer by saying December 31 of 2020, but yes, that's the intent. Any other questions? Would I entertain a motion? I'll move to approve the uh, limited use of uh, uh, facilities till January 1st, 2021. Motion by Neil. Is there a second? A second. Second, second by Gabe. Uh, any other discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor signify by aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstaining? Motion carried. Item E, consider consideration adoption of the Sauk County Health Protocol. Included in your packet was a document um, that was created in partnership with the Sauk County Public Health Office, school district administrators, school nurses, and frankly several others, both individuals and groups, had um, ample opportunity to provide input into its development. Uh, and so hopefully you've had a chance to um, skim through there a little bit. I'd be happy to uh, do my best to answer questions that you might have about it. Um, the, the idea is <coughs> excuse me, to uh, provide some guidance on a couple of things, like, for example, um, on the front side of that where it talks about school capacity, uh, it provides some um, direction on and, and warning and anticipation, et cetera, about how many children we're likely to allow into our school buildings, um, depending on these four um, indicators, one being new case rate, COVID, we're talking about COVID, new case rate, we're talking about uh, community spread, we're talking about COVID-like symptoms in the emergency room, and then percent positive across the community. <clears throat> Excuse me. And by community, we mean, at, at least at this point, we mean uh, Sauk County. So when those numbers are good, um, it allows us to, um, we'll, let me back off and say, we'll have discussion about, as a group, a countywide group, about um, the current status of those four uh, areas. And then um, if the numbers are good, it will allow us, if we choose, we're still going to have um, some level of local choice. Um, but if, we're, if the numbers are good, we can have in-person learning and whatever we want that to mean in Reedsburg. Um, if the numbers are less good, then uh, the guidance says, if we're willing to accept this guidance, is that um, 
we would be at some reduced capacity. And uh, there's no, uh, reduced capacity doesn't mean exactly 50%, uh, doesn't mean any exact specific number, but um, something noticeably less than full capacity. Uh, so that we are allowing um, a better chance of things like uh, social distancing, um, <laughs> gatherings are smaller than um, they might otherwise be, and those sorts of things which uh, most folks believe will help to uh, mitigate some of the risk. And then if the numbers are um, exceptionally poor, then um, we would be in a minimal capacity. It doesn't mean that we lock our doors and, and padlock them. It just means that almost no one is coming to our school buildings, but it would allow, for example, our teachers to come, our staff to come to do their virtual work from their uh, from our school buildings, and it would also allow us um, some small number of students to come who might need um, some of the special kinds of programming that we have available to uh, those whose um, language, first language is something other than English, for example, or um, students who need OT or PT services, speech and language services, other special education programming. Uh, again, small numbers of children that could come, maybe only for a portion of the day, to receive those uh, services. So uh, that's that's the school capacity uh, element of that. Uh, to the right side of that front page talks about uh, really just kind of um, the activity, COVID activity, and and. Uh, what certain elements of that would mean for us. And then on the back page, a uh, number of things related to communicating with families um, if and when we have uh, you know, certain things happening. Either we have a number of cases over a period of time or uh, we have more than uh, we would like to have at any specific time. So it could be um, snapshot or it could be um, taking a look at the last 28 day period <clears throat> gives us some guidance on again it's, it's mostly about communication not that we wouldn't all be communicating all of that important information to our families anyway but it standardizes a little bit the approach that we would be taking throughout the county that's the Reader's Digest version again if you've got questions or comments um, Any questions for Tom? Tom, can you just go over the schools that were involved in this again, please? Sure. The uh, school districts that um, have been involved in the conversation and ultimately uh, are uh, committed to uh, following this protocol would be uh, Sauk, Baraboo, Wisconsin Dells, Reedsburg, um, River Valley. And then though they have little or no... Um, Families in Sauk County, uh, both Weston and Ithaca, have been involved in the conversations and are relying on the same types of information for their decision making as well. Thank you. Question that I have, Tom, is uh, like if you look at uh, the case rates and stuff, you know, percent of positive tests across the community, that's a, a a published number that we, we see in a lot of times that comes out uh, a week or two weeks late. How will we react if we go from say less than 5% to that 5 to 10%? Are we just requiring that to go to reduce capacity or are they looking at uh, the other two items too? Yeah, we're, we're going to have um District administrators and uh, South County Public Health are going to have conversation about the current numbers, if you will, uh, on a weekly basis. Um, and then have conversation about and um, ultimately then have agreement about what the next steps will be, <clears throat> whether that's stay in the um, category that we're in, in person, reduced or minimal capacity, or if it's shift or pivot uh, from one to another. Um, and, <clears throat> and then also part of that conversation will say, if we're shifting from one to the other, then upon which date will we be making that shift? 
It's not going to be, we aren't going to move from one to another on a daily basis, for example. There needs to be, uh, you know, communication uh, to our staff, to our students, to our families, to our broader community, frankly, um, that allows at least a few days of um, advance notice of a shift from one capacity to another. Do we know how much advance notice we plan to give uh, families? We don't have that uh, absolutely nailed to a um, precise number of days, but my guess is that we'll be having the conversation. Um, what we're reviewing is the last, uh, you know, the, the last period of days, and so we're, they get that information usually on either late Friday or first thing Monday, and so my guess is we'll be having the conversation on Mondays, and if there's a shift, it'll, take, it'll begin on the following Monday would be my guess at this point. Um, with item number two there in terms of no significant change uh, from previous 14 days in terms of emergency room contacts, is, is that emergency rooms throughout Sauk County, uh, just Reedsburg, or will we be able to differentiate ourselves from other parts of the county? Yeah, at the present time, it's Sauk County collectively. Um, the ongoing discussion about this document and the work associated with it um, is aimed at trying to find a reasonable way to, um, if you will, quarter up the county so that maybe the Baraboo and the Dells has, uh, you know, the northeast corner, Reedsburg northwest corner, River Valley southwest, and Sauk southeast. Um, but so far, there's not been um, uh, an absolute comfort level about hanging our hat on uh, our ability to do that. And so at the present time, if tomorrow was September 1st, it would be a countywide decision. Uh, last question that I have, and maybe not the last, who knows. <laughs> That's okay. Uh, but is this a, li a living document, something that will, will evolve uh, over time? And if we approve it tonight, are we approving later iterations of it, or how will, how will we handle that? Yeah, the answer is yes. Uh, we're hoping that you'll approve it and that you would then um, anticipate that there could be some, um, you know, tweaking of it over time. Certainly, uh, we would do our level best to communicate those changes to you in a timely manner. And if at some point those changes cause you to be uncomfortable, you, we would just put it on a on an agenda where you could change your position about it. I, I don't think that the changes are likely to be um, that dramatic that would cause you, if you're, if you're able to support it today, I, I think you'll be able to support it uh, throughout time, but there will be ample opportunity for you to take a different position if for some reason you don't like the way it's unfolding. Personally, I like the idea of um, dividing the county into sections. I think it would be um, um, accepted better by our community if that happened, but that's just my suggestion. Yeah, and, and I think there's a um, broad um, interest in that. Uh, again, it just so far isn't, there, there's, there are too many um, things from one quarter of the county that influence certain elements of this throughout the county that, um, like I said, so far just hasn't given us the level of comfort to just hang our hat on district by district rather than countywide approach. Uh, but I do think that the day is coming where we'll probably get there. Um, I'm all about public health. Uh, by all means, I agree with Luann. It would be nice if we could separate and at the same time the county's not all that big and maybe we should just shut the whole thing down. Uh, at the same time, if we don't adopt this, what happens? Um, you're you're going to have to either have a 
regular school board meeting to tell us what you'd like to do in terms of uh, in-person, reduced, minimal, or whatever Reedsburg wants to call it, or you're going to have to have a level of comfort uh, in your district administrator to make those kind of decisions and have an occasional um, special meeting to tell him that he got it wrong. So if we leave it up to the district administrator, how would you get the numbers and how often would you get the numbers? Um, weekly by having conversation with the same people connected with this document. The numbers, you know, again, I, some of the numbers that are available would potentially be northwest quarter of the county specific, but some of it is not going to be. I guess I have a few questions, and I I have some concerns with this, to be honest. I There is some good information in here. I don't like the fact that everybody is thrown into the same pool and gone that way. I do have some concerns that if the percent of positive tests go up where we start school on in two weeks from tomorrow, two, yeah, tomorrow, um, and the percentage goes up, and we need to reduce by 40% or 50%, you know, the parents have already gone back to work, 90% of them, and now we're going to send their kids home, and they have to go on unemployment, take a leave of absence. I just have a real issue with that. Um, part of my concern is, just because you have a positive test doesn't mean you end up in the hospital. I know several. <laughs> One had a low-grade fever for a day and a half. The rest of the family had nothing. They all tested positive for it. Another co-worker had uh, minor flu symptoms. I, I guess I would feel different if everybody that got tested positive ended up in the hospital with it. But yes, I understand that it's a real concern for a certain group of people, but I, I just have a hard time with this. I, honestly, right now, I don't know which way I'd vote on it. <clears throat> Anybody else? Comments? Only comment I have is I, I think it's important for us to have something to to work off of, uh, something to give uh, families a heads up on rather than flying by the seat of our pants. Um, I, I I recognize that uh, this is not uh, probably ideal to Reedsburg. It probably is ideal to Sauk County, and. Uh, I, I still uh, think we need to have something in place uh, moving forward. Tom, I have a question for you. I see this was um, revised approximately 8-10 of 2020. How long did you guys work on putting this protocol together, approximately? Um, I don't know, probably six weeks. And the reason I'm asking is it's seven days later, I believe, from when this document was made. And as all of us up here know, this um, with COVID, it's a constantly changing um, process. And, you know, it, if it took you guys six weeks to put together this document, which you described as a living document, uh, I commend your guys' efforts. Is it a perfect document? It never will be but it does give us, per se, a baseline of what will be used as um, a decision-making process. Yeah, thanks. So, Tom, I have a question. Um, so we have essentially three documents. Uh, we have the Sauk County document, we have the uh, document from the, um, that's a public health that uh, the schools all signed, and then we have uh, the uh, plan that we approved uh, at the last board meeting. So, um, how are they similar and how are they dissimilar? 
Um, well, I think there's a fair amount of consistency throughout them. The initial document that you referenced, the um, countywide superintendents kind of took a position that our preference, stating what our preference is, which is, we didn't say it this way, but basically to have COVID go away so we can return to normal, <laughs> that our preference, um, from a more serious perspective, our, our preference is uh, to have um, all students and staff able to come to our school buildings for teaching and learning to take place. Um, again, that's, I don't mean to suggest that it wasn't important uh, because we felt it was important enough to say it. And so it you know, hopefully indicates that it was important in our thinking and in our work and in our planning. But at the same time, that's all it was, is um, a statement that our preference is uh, to return to normal teaching and learning practices. The um, back to school planning that we talked about last month and we're going to talk about here in a little bit is um, has been for uh, a long, long time been focused on uh, three things. One being that, which I just tried to describe, uh, return to uh, all day, all students, all day, every day, you know, um, what used to be normal. Um, and the, at the other end of the spectrum was uh, no students or very few students coming to our school buildings and that the vast majority of teaching and learning would take place in a virtual or remote kind of uh, environment. And then somewhere in between that is a hybrid where uh, students would, uh, if they choose to, um, uh, would come to school a portion of the time and receive teaching and learning opportunities virtually the other portion of the time. And so, uh, that, and so I, I think that that work uh, that we've been doing in this district and other districts have been, most other districts have been doing is somewhat um, in sync with the work of this um, Sauk County School COVID-19 protocol uh, particularly as it relates to the school capacity issue of in-person, reduced capacity, minimal capacity. I, I, I think there's a um, reasonable amount of common thread that flows through all of the documents you reference. I'm not saying I disagree with this document and I appreciate all the time that's been put into it. What I think I'm gonna hear is you gave me a choice and now you're taking away my choice. I think that's what I'm going to hear. I'm not saying that's right or wrong. I'm just saying I think that's what we're going to hear from our parents. Tom, I have just quick question here on uh, just I the, can't hear at this end. Sorry, I have a quick question on the numbers. Uh, like they're talking about uh, potential outbreak in investigation. If 5% of uh, students or staff in a building, uh, have we increased numbers out at uh, Loganville and Laval uh, some this year compared to last? Is 5% would be two. Uh, in those buildings a year ago, roughly. I don't think the enrollment is, uh, I don't think there's any significant difference in the enrollment at Loganville or Laval okay. uh, that uh, is likely to be present um, on September 1st as compared to um, when things were somewhat normal, let's say February. Um, Mr. Bindle is in the room. He could speak to that more specifically probably if we wanted or needed him to. Um, but uh, I think the simple answer is no, the numbers are not significantly different. And so I don't know if, if the focus of the question is that 5% of the students in either of those schools isn't a big number. Right. Yeah. That was, yeah, that was what I was getting to is... Uh, just, just curious if we were able to draw any, or if anybody felt the need to spread themselves out this year. That was 
kind of my curious. Yeah, there, there really hasn't been. Okay. And, and, and again, I, I guess I, uh, w without, I, I'm not defensive about any element of this document, um, or, or I hope I'm not. So if it comes across that way, um, don't let it, um, please. Uh, so all it means if we get to uh, five percent of the student population at a particular school, whether that's this building where there are um, 800 and some, or whether it's uh, Loganville or Bell, where there might be 40. It is easier to be a ventriloquist with this <laughs> mask on. Um, um, it, it, it doesn't mean we absolutely do anything. It just means that Sauk County Public Health starts to do a, you know, they, you know yeah. the light got shined a little bit brighter uh, so that they can investigate. And I, I'm confident that uh, if they look at a population of 42 students at a school building and we're you know, over the 5% threshold, and that means however many students that is, single digit number of students, that there's not gonna be, you know, panic in the streets. Yeah, that's okay. I'm yeah. I just curious if, uh, well, there was a little discussion of possibly having to spread out a little more. Yeah. And didn't know if we were able to. So on that same subject, Jeff, I'm going to ask a quick question since we're talking COVID and I can ask that question. Have we had any families in the district request Laval or Loganville because the populations are less there so their chances of contact, contracting COVID may be lessened? We have not heard that. That has okay. not been a specific reason. That hasn't been a question. Okay. Thanks. Anyone else? So just so I'm clear on the Sauk County one, one positive case in the district shuts the whole district. Uh, are you on the right-hand side of the first page? Yes. No, uh, it just means that uh, uh, Sauk County Public Health will start some uh, formal investigation at that point. Okay, thank you. So at what point do we reduce, I mean, if we start with all of those that have said they want to come back to school, at what point do we need to tell half of them they have to do virtual? Or isn't that even, is that still our choice? Yeah, I that's a great question. question. I didn't hear your question, Gary, I'm sorry. Let me see if I can read rephrase the question, you let me know if I didn't get it right, Gary, and then okay. hopefully uh, Luann and everybody else in, at the table will be on the same page. Um, <clears throat> at what point, if, if we adopt this, right, if we adopt mm -hmm. this um, line of thinking, at what point do moms and dads get notified that um, we might be at something other than full capacity on some date? Uh, the answer that I believe, if, if you, it's a great question uh, to be asked and answered before uh, you adopt this uh, or consider adopting this document, because the answer is that they'll know, the 80-some that are listening in, they're going to know um, yet tonight, um, if, you, if you adopt this, we're going to be at, if school started tomorrow, we're going to be at reduced capacity, and it's not likely to be different by September 1st. So we, we would simultaneously be telling people that we're going to be at reduced capacity, which means a hybrid model, not only at the high school, but throughout the district, would be our plan for September 1st. So does that mean then that we go to the same hybrids that we have set for the high school, where they go Monday, Thursday, and Tuesday, Friday, with Wednesday off? Is that the plan, or what? I, I yeah, the answer is yes. We'll, we'll get into some of those details when we get to a, um, the next agenda item, which is the back to school plan. But the answer is the sim it's a simple, straightforward question, and the simple, straightforward answer is yes. It, it seems to make the most sense that uh, if we're going to have 
uh, all children on a reduced schedule, reduced face-to-face -face schedule, that they would be on, they would all be on the same schedule, so that in some households where an older sibling is providing some level of care for younger siblings, um, we have them home on the same days and we have them in school on the same days. In those cases, which we think will be rare, but in those cases where moms and dads would say, wait a minute, for this reason or for, for reasons that are none of your business, we would rather have uh, child A attend Monday, Thursday, and child B attend Tuesday, Friday, we're going to do our absolute best to make that happen. I Again, we think that'll be rare. Anybody else? Is there, um, has this committee decided moving forward uh, especially after school starts, how frequently they, you will be meeting to review this document and make changes? Weekly. 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 Pardon me? Week. Once a week. Okay. I'm sorry. I just no, that's okay. <laughs> so will we be changing? If we adopt this, would we be changing that often so that start September 1 where we reduce capacity and then October 1 where the, the rate has gone down so we can be in person? I mean, I, how often are the changes going to take place for the students and the parents and the staff? I mean, we certainly can't do that on a weekly basis. I don't anticipate that it's going to change on a weekly basis, but the conversation about whether or not a, cha a change is in order would take place on a weekly basis. We're hoping that in most cases, um, the result of the conversa weekly conversation will be maintain status quo. Or, again, if we're at something less than full capacity, that we have an opportunity to move to full capacity and then status quo. Much of that is going to be about what's going on from a broader perspective. You know, what's going on in our community? What's going on in terms of uh, new cases in, in our county? Uh, what's, what's going on with emergency room activity related to COVID? It's not about what's happening in our schools. Or at least it's not only about what's happening in our schools. Well, if everybody's had their questions answered and expressed their concerns, um, I'd entertain a motion one way or the other. I would make a motion to approve the uh, Sauk County Public Health uh, uh, School COVID-19 protocol. Motion by Neil to approve. Is there a second? I second. Second by Gabe. Anybody have any other discussion? I'd like a roll call, please. Okay. Roll call vote, Barb. Steve Bauer. Aye. Dan Bright. Aye. 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 Abstain. Aye. Nay. Next item, um, item F, consider changes to back to school plans. Okay, uh, so um, you gave us the, the green light to, to move forward with our um, back to school planning and uh, we recognize that uh, some elements of that um, at the time and frankly some elements of it, uh, fewer elements of it uh, are um, still with a broad brush yet today, but uh, throughout the last four weeks now, we've been uh, putting some uh, specifics to that plan. And while most of the elements of that, I think were predictable and um, maybe not even newsworthy enough to fully report about tonight, we're happy to answer any questions about 
any and all of those areas. The, the glaring exception is about uh, the teaching and learning elements of, of that plan. And so uh, we do have a subcommittee of uh, folks. We, we have, I think you know we have a um, broad-based 41-member back-to-school team. And um, we have six different subcommittees, and the teaching and learning subcommittee is really uh, the, the group that I think you want to hear from uh, the most tonight. And so I think Linda's going to guide us through much of that. Uh, our uh, many other members of that subcommittee um, and the broader back to school team, our entire administrative team, um, our accountability team are all available to you either here in the room or um, by way of the internet. And so uh, we'd like for you to feel comfortable asking any questions that you might have. But I do think we'll start with uh, Linda presenting a little bit of an update on the teaching and learning side of things. All right, well, um, based on the guidelines that you've just shown us and based on what Tom has shared, um, it sounds as though we may be coming back hybrid. Uh, September 1st. The information that has been on the website up until now that you approved earlier, um, uh, Carrie Stanek and I worked on trying to consolidate the information into a one pager, which is what's being shared with you right now on the screen. Um, the one pager goes into more detail about what parents and students can expect when it comes to how will we take attendance, how will we do assessment and grading, what is the technology being used for, how will we communicate with parents and students about student progress, as well as how will parents get questions answered uh, concerning technology and virtual learning, and then um, information about building safety and then the instructional model. So we tried to cover all of the information if we were back face to face, as well as all the information if we were in a hybrid situation, K through 12, as well as the virtual information for those who have chosen that option for their children. When they came to face to face registration, um, the hybrid model for K eight was not developed at that point, but as the guidelines from Sauk County came through, it became very apparent to us we better get our ducks in a row with hybrid K-8 because it, it looked as though it might be an inevitability. So I, um, that piece was not in our original plans uh, that we shared with you that you approved, okay? It also was not a question that parents were asked K-8 when they came to face-to-face -face registration. We simply needed to know how many of them wanted virtual versus face-to-face -face when they came to registration. Um, the majority of them, of course, want face-to-face. -face. It's what we'd all like, right? All the teachers, the community, uh, parents, everybody would prefer to be face-to-face -face with kids. It's what we do. It's our business. Um, but our COVID is, um, is causing us to rethink a lot of things. And we have to be flexible, which Tom indicated to you also. About 18% of parents, roughly some, thir you know, as low as 13%, depending on the age level, the younger the children, the fewer parents chose virtual, which also makes sense, right? 4K, 5K, first, second graders. Um, it's hard to teach um, and learn virtually, but um, we still have a, a model um, that will be used for them. Even with a hybrid, those who chose virtual will be virtual five days a week. They won't come to school two days and be there because it's a hybrid model. They'll be in the virtual setting five days a week because that was the choice they made, right? The um, hybrid model, we will follow a Monday, Thursday cohort, Tuesday, Friday cohort. Students will be in school two days a week on those dates, days of the week. Um, a through L, last name, 
on Monday, Thursday, M through Z last name on Tuesday, Friday. There will be exceptions, as Tom indicated. If a parent would prefer that a child, even though their last name starts with B, um, be in the Tuesday, Friday, we will try our best to accommodate those requests. Um, if we had hundreds of those requests, it might be difficult because the whole point of the hybrid is 50% of the kids are in school, 50% are not, right? Three days a week, those children will be learning virtually. Um, the teachers are going to have regularly posted office hours so they can communicate with parents and parents can communicate with them um, concerning questions or uh, difficulties they might be having with their children um, accessing the technology or not understanding an activity or an assignment. Um, our teachers spent two weeks learning how to do this thing called virtual teaching. And the next three days and the next four days of next week, we have more time to really nail down what, it, what is it going to look like if you're in a hybrid situation. How are you going to teach this group of kids face to face while you're teaching this group of kids who are at home on Monday? And how are you going to teach this group of kids Tuesday face to face while that group you had yesterday is home on Tuesday? Because we can't um, only teach two lessons a week. We can't teach a lesson on Monday and a lesson on Thursday um, and repeat the lesson on Tuesday and Friday. We wouldn't cover the content that needs to be covered and the skills with our kids um, if we slow down the learning that much. So there will be at least four separate different lessons taught and those that are at home will access those lessons either synchronously or asynchronously. In other words, tune in while it's being taught or it will be recorded and you're going to log in later and learn the same lesson only in a recorded um, fashion. Um, what else can I tell you? Um, the, I, it's all explained in there. I don't know if, if you haven't had a chance to see this, but I think I've hit the highlights. Um, all the kids who came to registration in person got a device. If they were in 5K through grade two, they got an iPad. If they were in grades three through 12, they got a Chromebook. We have right now about an 80, about 85% of our students across the district have actually shown up for that person-to-person -person registration and picked up their devices. And we're missing about 15% of the kids, and that's across the board, not just at a certain level. Um, a Skylert message went out Sunday that alerted parents that if you, you know, we missed you. If you didn't make it to the in-person registration, we need you to show up at the school your child would be attending this year and fill out the paperwork and pick up their device. If you have children in multiple schools, you'll have to go to multiple school buildings to get all the devices. Um, in the buildings, face coverings will be worn by all teachers and all students uh, on the days that they're there and we'll do our best to keep them distanced six feet apart. Hybrid will actually help us with that because we'll have 50% of the students in the classroom instead of 100% or even 80%, let's say, right? Um, so we will be able to accommodate um, spacing them six feet apart and keeping them socially distanced. Uh, it's gonna be a training exercise with little ones uh, just like you train them to tie their shoe, um, train them to wash their hands, train them to blow their nose. We're going to be working on, you know, learning how to keep our mask on properly, up above our nose, across our mouth, um, as well as how to keep our hands sanitized, right? And not rub our eyes and uh, use only our own materials and not touch other people's markers and pencils and things like that. So. Uh, we're going to work hard on all of that. I'm open to answer questions if I haven't covered everything for you. I, I guess 
explain to me how a virtual day is going to work for these younger children again. Because I'm going to get questioned. I work. How am I going to do this? You get sure. home. You don't have enough time. Sure. It's going to be the concern that they all have. Yeah. Um, we have enough students, especially at the elementary level, who have chosen virtual uh, that we can do uh, probably assign a dedicated teacher at each grade level, at least K-1 and 2, if not more than 1, um, to just being a virtual teacher and just having virtual students on their class list. It will not be a seven and a half hour day online on their device. I mean, that would be cruel and inhumane punishment for not only the kids, but the virtual teacher and the parents. And the Definitely parents. the parents. Um, so it's going to be limited to about two to three hours for K through two, and about three to four hours for those in three through eight. Um, basically, a day is going to be scheduled so it starts at eight, probably with a Google Meet or calendar time or welcome to school, virtual school, right? And there will be many lessons taught, and then there will be assigned activities for them to go off and do. So those may be activities that involve their device, but they might also be activities that involve paper pencil, project work, uh, creating something, a scavenger. I hate when my name is in front. No, no. No. Or that. <laughs> that wasn't that you? Was. Um, and then they may come back for another mini lesson in a different subject, more activities, more um, uh, project work, also recess built in, lunchtime built in. There will be activities uh, from the Phi Ed department, activities from the art department, the music department. Um, there could be activities that the um, counselors at the buildings um, are having kids do. Uh, I can't think of. Those would be the kinds of things, but it would occupy about a two to three hour range of time involving their devices, and then other time that didn't to fill their day, okay? Because I did have that question from actually a daycare um, owner in town who knows that um, he's going to have four and five year olds at his daycare that whose parents have chosen virtual. And so he's going to be um, facilitating that within the daycare setting. Did I get to your question? Okay. Linda, I have a question on the devices. Kate, uh, Gabe, I can't hear you. <laughs> I'm sorry. I have a question on the devices. Um, the question that people ask me is uh, if a device gets wrecked, how much they are in to the district for? Yeah. Yeah. Um, Denise, I believe, has worked out um, a sheet that tells you what different things would cost to repair. Correct. So if it's accidental, the district would be um, covering at this point. Okay. If it's on purpose, or we can tell that it's on purpose. Sure. Um, yeah. $10 for broken key, okay. um, that we would then contact the parents. Okay. Um, and, and has there been a sheet that's been sent out or an email kind of breaking it down? It would, not at this point. It, it might give um, parents just more information better, I guess. Yeah. Is, yeah. We can get that on the website. Okay. Absolutely. All right. They did sign sheets basically saying they're responsible and that they'll take responsibility for making sure that the equipment is treated properly. Sure. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right, thank you. Good question. Anyone have anything else? Okay, thank Hearing, you. Thank you, Linda. Hearing none, I entertain a motion Bad. on item F. Yeah, like before board. you do that, I just want to make sure. I, I, I'm happy to have you take action and probably should just let you, but I, there are other elements of the 
of the back to school planning. Again, we don't have necessarily intended presentation about that, but wanted to make sure that if you have questions about any of it, like for example, student services, food service, uh, building and grounds kinds of things, general operations and transportation, those are the, those are the subcommittees that we have. Uh, so again, I, I just wanted to make sure that if you had uh, um, burning question on any of those, that uh, now would be a great opportunity for us to try to answer those. Otherwise, I'll let you take your motion. Anybody have any other questions on the other committees? I think some of that maybe was answered with the uh, previous one regarding minimal um, attendance. And some of that, I think, would really be the special ed stuff that would allow them to still come to school. Thanks. Hearing nothing else, I would entertain the motion on the back to school plan. I'll make a motion to adopt the changes to the back to school plan. Motion by Gabe to adopt. Is there a second? I'll second. Second by Neil. Um, any other discussion or comments? Hearing none, all those in favor signify by aye. 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 Those opposed? Any abstaining? Motion carried. Item G, the final action item, is consideration of an additional school nurse position. And that may be one that's probably really needed. Yeah, there's a supporting document uh, in your packet. Hopefully you've had a chance to uh, read through the kind of the rationale, if you will, for uh, the need for a uh, school nurse. Uh, we have, currently have two uh, nurses, full-time nurses uh, on our staff. Um, and by full-time, I mean uh, even prior to COVID, they're, uh, they've got full plates. And we're anticipating that uh, COVID is going to uh, cause us to have a, a number of other things that uh, mm -hmm. need to be covered um, as a result. And so, um, again, you can hopefully, you, hopefully you've had a chance to, to read through the um, information that was provided by Mr. Bindle and others. Uh, I think the, new, the nurses had some input into that as well. Um, at least one of our nurses, Lucinda, is here. I don't know if Lori's here. Jeff is obviously here. So if you've got questions about any of that, um, be happy to try to answer them. Any questions? So are we hiring this position as a permanent position or as a temporary full-time position? Uh, well, the intent would be for us to... Um, go do a thorough search, find a quality candidate that we're hopeful is, is uh, willing to make the commitment to us, I'll say for the long haul, um, there's, as there is with any other area, I suppose, um, the chance that if at some point we determine that we didn't need three full-time nurses, while on the one hand we might welcome that opportunity, I, I just mean from, uh, from one aspect, the uh, simple answer is we're looking at it being uh, a long-term uh, position. And uh, as we do with all of our positions, we'll continue to monitor the need. Another piece of information is the, this position uh, for funding, the duties and the responsibilities would fall right in line with the elementary and secondary school emergency relief fund ESSER, and then we could look to the federal government that's giving us a little over $400,000 to fund that portion of it. I know there's been sensitivity about committing to costs and where are we at with our budget. And quite frankly, until the middle or so of October, we won't have a real clear picture for the current fiscal year. But this staff position for nursing and the duties, as Mr. Bindle has outlined, with, along with the two school nurses that we currently have, clearly would fall within the ESSER funding area. Thank you. 
Any questions? Uh, Tom, just to clarify, when you, when you were commenting that this is a long-term commitment, is this a yearly commitment when you say long-term, or, or what are you saying there? We, yeah, for sure we would offer a contract for the 2021 school year, yes. Anyone else? Hearing none, would entertain a motion for the additional school nurse? I'll make a motion that we uh, approve the uh, additional school nurse position. Motion by Bruce. I'll second. Approve. Pardon? Alice. Alice, second. Alice, second. Anybody have any comments? Questions? Hearing none, all those in favor signify by aye. 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 Those opposed? Any abstaining? Motion carried. Thank you very much. Last up is discussion items. Item A, 11A, is Title IX Board Policy Updates. In your board packet, you received just a brief narrative um, summarizing the changes in Title IX. And, <clears throat> excuse me, and then you also have a copy of the proposed new policy from NEOLA, Policy 2266. I forget how long it is, but it originally started about 26 to 28 pages with all the narrative and dialogue that they have. We've uh, shortened it to the only 15 or 16 pages that it is now. And again, that's the first reading. Uh, we did discuss with Bruce Hutler, the policy committee chair, about skipping the policy committee. Usually reviews all policies with this federal law changing. It is effective August 14th, as we told you last month. We're well aware of it and we're following the changes. There is some um, discrepancies or differences between Title IX changes and other existing um, discrimination type laws where um, several states, including Wisconsin, has sued the federal government for clarification about the conflicts that they have in certain areas of the new Title IX. We will follow through all the requirements of the new federal law and this is the first reading on that policy. And, uh, if you have any suggestions or changes, please contact me. Jeff Bindle or Michelle Thompson are also our Title IX uh, coordinators and investigators. If you had any comments, they would also be willing to answer them. Do you have any questions on it? And this will come out in the OLA. Is that correct? Or is out in the OLA? <coughs> Will. 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 Okay. <clears throat> Nobody has any comments on it. We can go to your discussion item B, which is handbook changes. Similar to policy, we process handbook changes with the first reading as you have here tonight. These suggested changes for the handbook are only focused on uh, items concerning COVID-19 and recommendations from the Wisconsin Association of School Boards on their policy recommendations that they ask or have suggested school districts incorporate these portions of it. Michelle Thompson took the information that WASB provided and has summarized it in the format you have in front of you. Our recommendation tonight is for you to consider it. It would be after next month's reading, the second reading would be added to the handbook. Questions on it? Okay, hearing none. And the last item is face coverings. Yeah, there just has been uh, a fair amount of uh, discussion about uh, face coverings and we just wanted to um, place it on the agenda in case there was um, any desire or need uh, for board to have um, some public discussion about it. I mean, I think that um, it was covered at least to some degree in uh, other elements of our conversation tonight. So uh, it's fine if there's no need for additional discussion about it. But if, um, if anybody had the interest or desire to kick the topic around a little bit, 
we'd be more than happy. I think as Linda indicated, our, um, based again on your earlier action and our continued commitment, we're intending to have students and staff uh, wearing face coverings, appropriate face coverings, uh, when school begins. And um, we've been doing that in our school buildings uh, for what, since the governor's order was place, in place. So uh, again, just an opportunity for you to make comment if you wanted to. Otherwise, there's no obviously no action required or anything like that. Have we clarified any, anywhere what face coverings are allowable? Which type, what kind? I know there was some discussion regarding neck gaiters um, and face shields. And I just, so that everyone is clear on what is, I'll say approved for lack of a better word. <clears throat> yeah, there's, um, well, <clears throat> while I fully recognize and, and frankly appreciate that um, your decision came before uh, the government ordered them to be in place. Um, and frankly, I suspect that our decision to utilize face coverings will last longer than the government order as well. Um, there is some uh, debate about what is or is not an appropriate face covering. Uh, currently, we're utilizing the governor's order as um, at least a significant guide in, in uh, what is or is not an appropriate face covering. Uh, uh, included in that, as you probably know, a face shield is not uh, acceptable, doesn't meet the standard, and so it won't be uh, meeting the standard for us either. Uh, the issue of the, the neck gaiter uh, buff, whatever uh, you might be referring to it as, um, uh, so far we're uh, allowing those to be utilized, although we're, in, we're encouraging them to not be used or discouraging them from being used, however you want to view that, I guess. Um, uh, just because there apparently is a study or two out there that uh, is less than complimentary about them. Uh, I think it really comes down to the material being utilized in whatever type of face covering you're wearing. And so um, we're going to try to stay focused on that. And, uh, and again, until maybe further guidance comes on that. But so far, we're allowing them, the gator I'm referring to. Uh, we're not allowing the shield, or if you want to wear a shield, cert certainly some folks will be using a shield for some applications, but they'll have to do that in combination with an appropriate mask. Thank you. I don't know that we can, being a public facility, ban the um, it's away from me here. Um, the gators or a bandana, but I just think it's fair for all of our staff to be aware that the gators and bandanas do not provide them the protection that a face mask does or their students that they are working with as long as everyone is aware that there is a protective device, one that is better than another, I'm fine with it, so. Is there any considerations for eye covering? Uh, yeah, again, there will be some application for that on a, at least an occasional basis, whether that is uh, in the form of a shield or some uh, you know, some other method uh, for eye covering. Certainly our nurses and uh, health aides uh, will be utilizing <coughs> um, elements of PPE that other members of our staff won't be, or at least won't be on a real regular basis, maybe an occasional basis. But yes, we, we've been uh, in regular communication with our um, nurses and other health um, staff uh, to help us to identify whatever PPE they're anticipating that they might need and we'll do all that we can to make sure that it's available. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? I, w I will say uh, that we're uh, planning to recognize the face covering as either um, you know, under the same 
kind of the same approach that we would with our students for appropriate attire and the same with our staff in terms of dress code, if you will, you know, so that we have some control over, um, you know, the appropriateness of face covering. Yeah. Fully understand that one. Hear nothing else. I would entertain a motion to adjourn to closed session. Make a motion we adjourn to closed session. Motion by Bruce. Is there a second? I'll second. Second by Luann. Roll call, please. Aye. 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 We are in executive session, and I want to thank all of you for coming tonight. And those of you that have listened in on um, Google Meet or Zoom, um, thank you for so spending better. the time with us. I don't necessarily want to discourage for, uh, folks from uh, either hanging out and waiting to see what happens at the end of executive session or those who are connected to us virtually. Um, but I uh, fully anticipate that there's going to be little or there, there's likely to be no um, action taken either in executive session or following it. So uh, if you have a question about that, you can follow up with us tomorrow or um, we will reconvene that meeting in open session for about 10 seconds to adjourn. But um, we don't anticipate anybody will be joining us. Thanks. We are going across the parking lot to the... Um, central office building for our executive session. <laughs>